Well, we got a few kids. Come, come on up, and then all the rest of you. I want, at some point during this children's story, I'm going to need a little bit of participation. So, oh, now I got one of my real kids coming up here. This is one of my kids from back when he really was a kid. Thank you. All right. Now, we used to have out front, when you would come up to the church, um, I don't know if you remember, Andrew, because maybe it didn't look so bad when you were a little kid. But I'm going to ask Miss May over here. When you looked at the front of our church, over on this side, not now, I'm talking about used to be, was it gorgeous and beautiful over there? Used to be. What was, what was over there? Was it a gorgeous tree? Or was it kind of an ugly tree? Yeah, it was green. It was sort of green. And, and the longer it was there, it was probably, probably kind of pretty when he was a little boy and used to see it. But over the years, it had gotten looking pretty bad. And every once in a while, we'd talk about getting rid of that ugly tree. And it just kind of filled over there, and people would go, yeah, but if we cut the tree down, then you can see the PG&E box. Because there's a big old PG&E box there, and that's not pretty. So give me my first picture here. So that's what it used to look like. And I guess you can try to be positive and go, that's oh, not too bad. But then when you really looked at it and realized it was always full of hornets, how many of you have gotten stung by the bees at the front door of the church? I know several have, our adults and our kids. Well, that wasn't fun, and guess where they lived? In that big old ugly tree that kept getting uglier all the time. And then every once in a while, a new branch would die, and then it looked worse. So we finally, and of course nobody was watering anything, and every once in a while somebody would go, you know there's a fig tree under there. I know. It's been there a long time. I'll bet that's a scrawny little thing. Mmm, probably. Well, finally we got somebody to cut down the tree. Actually, several trees, several bushes, several mess that was there. And I said, the only thing I'm going to ask you, please don't cut down the fig tree. They're going, you want the fig tree? That scrawny little thing underneath there? It doesn't even have any fruit. It's never had any fruit. I know, but I want the tree. Please don't get rid of the tree. Well, oh, good. Hi, Daniel. And so I said, just, just try to be careful. All right, but we can't guarantee where this tree is going to fall. We don't know what's going to happen or anything else. And probably just cutting this down is going to destroy that scrawny little fig tree. Okay, well, just try, please. So they cut the thing out. And here's what it looked like. Okay, now this pretty tree that you're seeing here is actually the myrtle out by the street. It was taken from that far back, so we got that in there. And there's our famous PG&E box. And yes, it sticks out there like a sore thumb. And do you see a fig tree? No, can't see the fig tree, because at this point, it's kind of laying on the ground. 
And it's about this big, the poor little twigs that are branches. And by now, it's probably about, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 years old. It should have been having figs on it for a long time. Nothing. And everybody's going, and you want to keep that. Yes, I want to keep it. So when nobody was around to give me advice and tell me what to do and all of that kind of stuff, unfortunately, I'm down here a lot when nobody's around. I went out and I trimmed some stuff and I cut away some stuff and I found the best branches I possibly could in the right places that I could possibly find them. And then I took them and I brought them up because they were, they were laying on the ground. And I brought them up together with a bungee cord. You know what a bungee cord is? You know, it's, it's like an elastic, like a big elastic thing, like a, a stretchy thing with a hook on each end. And I took it and I wrapped it around all of the branches. That's how easily everything moved. But it kind of was a nice shape when I got done. And it was all kind of leaning against each other, you know, and it was just kind of holding each other up. And it didn't look half bad. At least I didn't think so. Some people, you're really, really going to save that. Yes, I really am. Well, you know, the nice thing about it is, is because since all that other mess was cut out of there, and I was trying to do something with the fig tree. My friend Judy, I think I saw her come in back here somewhere. Didn't I see Judy come in? There's Judy. She says, can I water stuff? All of it looks like it's trying to die. And I said, oh, yes. Please come water stuff. Now, this was all last year. So she started watering stuff. And stuff quit dying. And I kept checking my fig tree. And you know what? The branches looked like they were getting just a little bit bigger. And I gave it a bit of time. And then I went out and I was looking at it one day and I'm going, what is that? Those are figs. Teeny, tiny little figs. But they were figs. Figs. I hadn't even gotten the bungee cord off it yet. And it was already going, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. And there were little figs on it. And one Sabbath, I'm sitting there. You know, I usually sit back there near, near the back. And I'm sitting there. And Pastor Murray comes in. And he came in from out front. And he dropped something in my hand as he went walking past me. And I looked, and there in my hand was a little purple fig, probably about that big, no more than a minute. But it was a fig. Well, now, let's see. David, what did you try for the first time last Sabbath when you were here? What did you try when we went on our walk? A fig. David had never had a fig before. And I took the kids for a little short walk. And right now, our fig tree. Now, let's see the next one. Oh, look at the thing. There's my fig tree. That's what God did to our fig tree because we loved it a little bit. And we didn't say, well, it's kind of ugly and scrawny, so let's just pull it out. We loved it, and we took care of it, and we let it lean on each other. All those branches leaning on each other. Now, are we just going to go, okay, cool. We'll just let it grow now and do whatever it wants. Is that what we're going to do? No, we have to keep on taking care of it. Because you know what's going to happen if we did that? It would grow up, and it could poke holes in the roof because it get higher than the roof. And we have what's called a skin on the roof. And so it can mess up the roof. So we need to make sure branches don't go up there. 
we can encourage them to come this way, and they'll cover up that ugly pg and &E box, and we can kind of help it to go where it needs to go. And in the meantime, if anybody wants really, really good figs, I don't think anyone was out there this week picking them. So there should be some pretty good figs to snack on. Just please be gentle with the tree. And we're going to just keep on loving that little tree, aren't we? And someday, 30 years from now, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk to Grandpa Andrew over here. <laughs> and we'll go, Grandpa Andrew, so what about our ugly, poor, little, scrawny fig tree? And he can tell his grandchildren all about it, right? Isn't that cool? And you know, all it takes is giving room, letting God in, just with our lives. Open up, let God in. And it's amazing what he can help us do. All right, boys and girls, you can go back to your seats. Good morning. I'm glad to see we're growing. As word gets around that we are open for full services now, for Sabbath school, for church, and for potluck. We're glad all of you are here. And we hope to see you many more times. You guys are all welcome to come back again. <laughs> and I was thinking about something. I want to have a word of prayer. But first, how many of you have a special prayer request? Hold up your hand if you have a special Okay, the Lord knows what every one of those special requests are, even if the rest of us don't. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God who listens to us, and even more, you're a God who knows everything, every concern we have, every prayer we have for our children, for our friends, Father, there are many things happening in this world today. We know that Jesus must come soon. We pray that you would bless each one of us who are here, bless those who are not able to attend. And Father, we pray that you would bless each person who's, for whom we are praying. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, talking about talents today, and this is not going to be an ordinary talent type sermon. Many years ago, uh, I used to attend a public school. And that year, the school must have had a surplus in their uh, account because they bought a whole bunch of musical instruments and they were uh, distributing them to the students who wished to learn to play an instrument. Now, I had my goal, I wanted to be able to play a trumpet. Now, why I wanted a trumpet, I don't know, but I've always liked the sound of a trumpet, that nice pure note. But uh, when I asked for a trumpet, the teacher looked at me and said, you have a cold sore, and we can't give you an instrument at this time. Now, I've always been, I was, as I was thinking about that, I, I know I've always had that uh, tendency to get cold sores. But in any event, uh, a few weeks later, as this, this cleared up, I went back to the teacher and said, I want a trumpet. 
trumpets are all gone. We have a clarinet, though. So I took a clarinet. Now, uh, this was quite some time back, I think 1840, no, 1949. Uh, not quite that old. But uh, I stuck with that uh, clarinet, took lessons through the eighth grade. Uh, a problem I had, though, uh, I was shy. Now, people say, well, you're not shy. I was then. Uh, and now I don't mind talking because nobody listens to me anyhow. But uh, the one thing I didn't like to do was play before the church or even before my parents. You know, I, I enjoyed playing the clarinet. But uh, because people kept saying, well, you know, you have this ability, you need to have special music. No, no, not me. So uh, when I finished the eighth grade, I kind of, well, I quit taking lessons and the clarinet kind of got pushed off to the side. Uh, eventually I sold it. But you know, a few years ago, uh, I thought, you know, I would like to uh, get a clarinet and get back into playing it. So I picked up a used clarinet. And you know what? I couldn't remember. I couldn't even remember how to find middle C on the clarinet. You know, it's got these holes you cover with your fingers and these little levers you push with this finger or that finger or whatever. And I couldn't remember. Now, admittedly, uh, my earlier clarinet playing was many years before, but uh, I guess I had never heard that homily, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. Ever heard that? So eventually I gave the clarinet away. <laughs> I gave up on it. Have you ever had that experience? A talent that you've had? Uh, I won't ask you to raise your hand on that, but probably most of us have. Um, you used to have a talent, but you haven't used it. And now it's kind of, you know, passed off into history. As we studied our Sabbath school lesson this week, we're talking about uh, uh, telling the world about Jesus, witnessing for Jesus. Is that a talent? We have many talents. I think all of us have talents to one degree or another. Uh, so far as I know, everybody here has the ability to talk and the ability to hear, to listen. Uh, some of us maybe don't hear so well as we used to, but uh, isn't that a talent? I mean, if you find somebody who has a speech impediment, they would say, yes, you, every one of us here has a talent. How about education? Um, I remember my dad telling me that uh, he dropped out of school after the ninth grade. Uh, my grandmother had passed away and my uh, grandfather unfortunately took to drink and uh, dad uh, dropped out of school to go get a job. Of course, that was many years ago now. Wouldn't, 
Today, they, he wouldn't be allowed to do that. But uh, some of us, uh, I don't know how many of you are college graduates, but I suspect there's uh, quite a number of you who have at least some college, probably a degree. Uh, Dr. Lavolsi over here, have you ever uh, wondered what it takes to make a doctor? <laughs> Years. Uh, I remember at one time I used to wonder, why is it that in a Seventh-day Adventist church, if a doctor and his family moved to the church, almost immediately he's selected to be an elder. Now, isn't that kind of, uh, you know, here's a doctor, ah, we'll promote him. Uh, that fellow over there, he's, he just works on a farm. He'll never make an elder. But I got to thinking about that. What does it take to be a doctor? Of course, there's the usual elementary education, high school education, four years of college, and that most people don't get that far. But then, after the four years of college, now it's back to medical school for a couple of more years, three, four years, five years, uh, and then, of course, there's, uh, the doctor may specialize. He may become a, uh, a heart doctor, whatever they're called. Uh, or he may, uh, you know, go into this specialization or that. So there's a couple more years. Now, of course, we realize all that is pretty simple. I mean, you know, it's just a matter of showing up for class once in a while. Isn't that right, Dr. Lavolsi? Mm, yeah, uh, he doesn't agree with that statement. Actually, I, he lives and breathes. He's thinking about his studies as he goes to sleep at night. And the first thing in the morning, there it is again. He's got to study this a little bit more. How many of you would like to go through, um, well, let's see, we 12, 16, 20, 20 to 25 years of education. How many of you would like to do that? Not me. But that's what it takes. Uh, dedication. Uh, and I got, as I say, I got to wondering why do we always, do the doctors always become elders in the church? It's because they have that dedication. Okay, now coming back to us. What about our education? You know, there's other things, uh, biblical knowledge. How many of us... Um, Gloria, how many years have you been coming to church? Okay. And what has Gloria been learning here? What do each of us learn? We learn about the Lord, don't we? We learn, um, there is so much knowledge that you probably don't even realize just how much you know. Now, uh, there are many reasons why people become Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Um, probably the primary reason is because we follow the Bible. But you know, uh, as an astronaut said, you know, I got out in space, but I didn't see God. Uh, and so much of the world doesn't believe in God. 
But as we study, uh, one of the uh, convincing evidences to me, so far as I am concerned, it is absolute proof that there is a God. Are the prophecies in the book of Daniel? Have you ever considered that here was a man who wrote a book 500 years before Christ lived on this earth, and he laid out the major world powers for the next 2,000 years? Now, boy, he must have guessed pretty good, huh, to just make all that up in his mind? No, there is a God who told him. And, you know, just, it's just by coincidence that he said, well, there's, this first kingdom, Babylon, is going to pass away, and then the Medes and Persians are going to come along. And after, you know, a reasonable amount of time, then the Greeks are going to become a world power. But they're going to pass away too, and then, then it's going to be the Romans. And boy, that was, that was pretty good guessing just to, uh, you know, especially when these powers didn't exist as a power at the time he's telling this. We have knowledge from the Bible. You know, there's some other talents that we have. Uh, <laughs> if I thought it was kind of interesting that um, Sherry, in that letter, that, I, that thank you note that I read a little bit earlier, uh, she talked about that prayer bunny. Now, those of you who have been members here very long know who she was talking about. Uh, Evelyn always sat in the second pew right here in the end, uh, it, it's, we've spoken with Evelyn several times since she moved back to Texas, uh, and she's keeping her local, her phone number, the same phone number that she had when she was here, uh, because she gets calls from a lot of you. Evelyn, I need special prayer for this. And Evelyn is right there. How many of you have talents? Uh, the kind that I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about uh, anything super special. Uh, you know, I still would like to play the trumpet. Uh, and I'm kind of, I, at this point, I figure I'm going to have to wait till I get to heaven. Now, uh, <laughs> the Lord is going to give us some talents there, and we don't even know what all those talents are going to be. But we know one of the talents we're going to have, we're going to be able to play the harp. Now, probably none of you have ever taken lessons on playing a harp. But when we meet, when we stand before the Lord, we're going to have a harp. I don't think it's going to be one of these big, tall things because I think it's going to be small enough that we can carry. But, uh, you know, there are talents I want to develop in heaven. Uh, you know, we have all of these talents. I want to, a few, three, four weeks ago, uh, you may have noticed in your quarterly there was a suggested outside reading uh, from the book Christ Object Lessons. It was a chapter about talents. And that's what first made me think I would like to talk about that. Uh, actually, it was a fairly long chapter. But there's a couple of paragraphs in there, a couple of statements in there that really caught my attention. And I thought I would bring them to your attention too. Uh, on page uh, 262 and 263 in that book, we're told, unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. Now that's a quotation from Luke chapter 12, verse 48. 
But Mrs. White goes on, we shall individually individually each one of us we shall individually be held responsible for doing one jot less than we had the ability to do we shall be judged according to what we ought to have done but did not accomplish because we did not use our powers to glorify god wow ever thought about that if you think that's a pretty harsh statement, she goes on in that same paragraph. If we do not lose our souls, we shall realize in eternity the result of our unused talents. For the knowledge and ability that we might have gained and did not, there will be an eternal loss. Uh, you know, that's pretty serious. In Sabbath school today, somebody uh, mentioned that uh, while the Lord has said that he will wipe away all tears and all sorrow, that doesn't happen until the end of that thousand years after the Lord takes us to heaven. Now, why would there be tears during that thousand years? Because, my friends, what if somebody who's a very good friend of yours, or maybe even a relative, a son or a daughter, what if they're not in heaven? You know, I hope that never happens to us, but stop and think about that. Would you shed a tear for them? I think so. And that kind of brings me back to talking about talents again. You know, we have talked about uh, various talents that we all have. Um, Christian love. Is that a talent? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Evelyn's uh, reputation as a prayer bunny, and she'll tell you that she is. But, yeah, that's a talent, isn't it? Uh, when we, uh, I, when you go to the grocery store and the uh, cashier checks out all of your things that you've purchased and you hand the money to the cashier and she rings everything up and hands you your change and your sales slip there, what does she say? Have a nice day. Yeah. What do you say back to her? Or do you just take your slip and run off because groceries cost $100 now and you can remember when you got the same amount for $5. And then I'm going back a long ways, yes. Uh, Gasoline is $3 a gallon now, and I'll betray my age again. When I first got my driver's license and my car, I was getting gasoline at 17 and 18 cents a gallon. Uh, and those of you who are young, you can shed your tears now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we have talents. Perhaps uh, we need to witness to that person at the grocery store. Can you, now some of you may do this, stand behind a cash register all day long, you know, charging out things and so forth. And uh, do, you, do you ever get complaints? Have you ever heard somebody complaining to the cashier? Yeah, I have. And they, it seems like they almost hold the cashier responsible for the high prices. Uh, and the, they, they don't have anything to do with it. But, you know, maybe we need to uh, take a moment 
use some of our talents to provide a little cheer for that person. You know, there are, uh, we talked today about, uh, in the Sabbath school class, I wish all of you had had the opportunity to be there. Uh, we were talking about uh, how you ended up as a Christian. And it was interesting, particularly as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, it was very interesting to listen to all the, uh, uh, the stories that led a person to the Lord. A tremendous variety of backgrounds from uh, probably what, if we knew all the details, what we would consider to be a very shocking background. Uh, others, my wife grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Her parents were. It would be nice to say that that's always true, but it isn't. But, uh, you know, Talents, what talents do you have that you can use for the Lord? Because you know, one, one day we will all, all of us I trust here, will be in heaven. How many of your friends might not be there? If the Lord were to come tomorrow, can you think of some of your friends who won't be in heaven? And maybe we need to start using some of those talents to start telling people about the Lord. Uh, I'm not talking now about whether you're trained as a minister or anything else. I'm talking about whether you're, you love the Lord and you're concerned for people. The Lord has given all of us talents. Some of those I uh, mentioned there. Uh, you know, it's kind of scary when you think about the Lord holding us account, uh, accountable. I'm sure glad that we have a forgiving God that even as we perhaps look back in our lives and say, well, I could have developed that talent I should have developed that talent, but I didn't. But it's never too late, by the way. Uh, you know, I say that my wife, from time to time, gets frustrated with her computer uh, when she's trying to look at something online, and she'll say, Jim, I can't get this to work. And being the helpful husband that I am, my response is, call one of the kids. Uh, you know, uh, I've mentioned this before, but that group right back there in the back of the church that are running the sound system and all of that, I admire them and I'm very thankful to them. Uh, you know, they know more than I ever knew about computers, about uh, sound systems, PA systems. They get in here every Sabbath. They use their talents for the enjoyment of all of us. Amen. How many talents do we have or could we have? Now, uh, I think most of you are aware that uh, Wally and Marilyn have this thing called a sunshine band. Uh, they get on the phone every Sabbath afternoon and start making calls to some of our church members who are not able to come to church, uh, to some of our church members who perhaps are going through a trying time at the moment. And they sing a song to them. Uh, and, well, again, referring back to Sherry's note, uh, Jelina was on that prayer list, and of course Sherry was there, and so she also got to share in the singing of those songs. But you know, the Lord has given us talents. 
the Lord has given us the ability to develop talents. And that's really what I'm trying to say today. Uh, another paragraph I want to read from Christ Object Lessons going along with what I read a little bit ago. We should not talk of our own weakness and inability. This is a manifest distrust of God, a denial of his word. When we murmur because our burdens or because of our burdens or refuse the responsibilities he calls upon us to bear, we are virtually saying that he's a hard master, that he requires what he has not given us the power to do. And I think that last sentence maybe is the key there. Um, it has been said that God's callings are enablings. God never asks you to do something that he won't give you the power to do. Now, uh, usually I hear those words spoken about the time the uh, nominating committee are making their calls. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever wished to have your phone disconnected for a couple of weeks there? <laughs> but, you know, the Lord does call us to develop our talents. There are sometimes things that we think are impossible for us to do. But the Lord has promised us strength. And that's what Mrs. White was saying in that paragraph I just read. That... Uh, we shouldn't look at our inability to do something, at our own weakness, because the Lord is always there. He's right there at our elbow. If we will look to the Lord to develop the talents that perhaps we already have to some degree, if we will use those talents in the Lord's work, he will provide for us all the strength and guidance that we need. Uh, you know, as, as we witness to the community, we have to use everything that the Lord has given us. Uh, we've talked about that in Sabbath school. We've heard it perhaps from our parents. Uh, when we were in school, if you went to a, one of our church schools, I'm sure you've heard that. But you know, we, each one of us, uh, when we get to heaven, we will have the opportunity to meet those that we have influenced who are there because of our, our talents, our influence. You know, this, I was interested to hear uh, the comments uh, by our visitors here today uh, talking about witnessing. Uh, they, uh, they provide a witness among the motorcycle groups. Now, I've ridden a motorcycle for a number of years, but I've never been part of the Hells Angels group. And whenever the rest of us, we straight guys uh, thought of Hell's Angels, we always said, well, those are the one percenters that are giving us the bad name. You think that's true? <laughs> but this group are using a talent, a talent of riding a motorcycle and enjoying it, a talent of remembering that they're God's children. Uh, James was talking there this morning about uh, witnessing a booth they set up at a large national motorcycle meet up in uh, the Dakotas. How many people show up? 15,000? Uh, no, this year was estimated 460 thousand. Okay, I'm a little bit low on my estimate. 400,000 people. Now, it isn't just there that they witness. I know that uh, there are, what, eight or 10 different groups, motorcycle meets here in California every year. And they 
witness to those groups too. Uh, and I mention this because, you know, that's a talent that is, they are using for the Lord. And what I'm in, trying to encourage is stop and think about the talents you have, the talents that you could use to witness for the Lord. We all have those opportunities, whether it's the clerk at the grocery store or at a motorcycle meet. The Lord has given us talents, and that I encourage you to develop and use those talents. The Lord doesn't ask any of us, uh, or at least I don't think anybody here is a brain surgeon, the Lord doesn't ask you to perform uh, even a, a simple appendectomy, um, but he's given us talents. I pray that you will use the talents that the Lord has given you and that you will not, uh, not let the clarinet lay on the shelf and lose the ability. Let's stand and sing the closing song, Watchman, Blow the Gospel Trumpet. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message that you have given to us. 
Father, we know it's the most important message in this whole world. I pray that you would bless each one of us as we leave now, that we take this message with us, that we do blow the trumpet for those who don't know you, that we give them this message. Father, it's a message of peace and freedom in this troubled world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.